Hello, this is Father Adam. I'm so happy to have this opportunity to come to you during this time of the coronavirus pandemic to offer you some reflection and nourishment from the richness of the Word of God to offer you some good news that I know you can use in your life. On Thursday, April 2nd, when all the priests during the Chrism Mass are to gather with the bishop in the cathedral, I didn't have the opportunity to do that this year because of this pandemic and churches are closed. There's no mass being celebrated publicly. And for the first time in my 10 years, I didn't have the chance to renew my vows, which I was looking forward to because this is my 10th anniversary and I was sad and I was feeling depressed. I had all this gloom and darkness come over me. And what are we to do when all those depressing feelings, those feelings of despair come over us, those feelings from the evil one, from the accuser, from the devil come over us? What are we to do? The same thing that Jesus did in his own desert experience when the devil tempted him, made him feel like he was alone, like he wasn't going to survive, like he wasn't going to make it, like... This was all gloomy and dark. What did Jesus do? He responded to the devil with the word of God. And that's how we respond to the devil as well. And so I picked up my phone and I, my phone on Thursday, April 2nd, when I was feeling down, I looked at what the lectionary said for that day. What was the reading that the church provided us for that very day? And it was the reading from the book of Genesis chapter 17, when, and you know, there are no coincidences in life. There are only God incidences. Everything is ordained by God. God is in charge. And so it wasn't an incident. It was a God incident that that very day I opened the Bible and I look. And there the reading from the book of Genesis is where Abram is lying prostrate and God speaks to him and says to him, I will make of you a father to all nations, I will give you the charge to be the father to a multitude of nations. No longer, God says, will you be called Abram, but I am changing your name and you will be from now on called Abraham. And I reflected that isn't that what happened when I was ordained a priest 10 years ago? I was lying there prostrate, prostrate on the floor of the church during the ordination ceremony, and I was changed from being Adam to being Father Adam. And I was reminded of that, and I remembered that this past Thursday. What happened right after my ordination when I talked with my grandmother, and she keeps calling me Father Adam, whereas she always called me Adash, Always, always. And she keeps calling me father and father. And I said to her, why are you calling me father? And she says to me, you are no longer Adam. From now on, you are a priest. You have been changed, she, she said. Your identity is changed. You are father Adam now. And then she said something that has resonated with me to this very day. She said, don't you ever forget it. So don't you ever forget it. My grandmother, who has no formal education, has been educated in the life of the Spirit, the life of the Spirit of God, which revealed something to her that she in turn revealed to me, that my identity changed when I was ordained a priest, and I better not forget it. Now, this name change is of crucial importance for our journey of faith. In the Bible, every name has a meaning. Every Hebrew name has a meaning. Abram means he is sprung from a noble father. Abraham means he is the father of a multitude of peoples. Whereas before God says, with this name change, you belonged to the father of this world. He says this to Abraham. You belong to the father of 
this life, the earthly father, now God says to Abraham, you belong to me. I am your father and I will make you prosperous. You will be the father of a multitude of nations. I will take care of you, Abraham. That's what God is saying to Abraham when he changes his name. He changes his identity from an earthly identity to a godly, a spiritual, a divine identity. The same identity that has been given to each and every one of us. God says to Abraham, I am God and there is no other. You will be the father of so many nations that you can't even imagine. Multitudes. God made promises and God keeps them. The very same thing that happened to Abraham happened to me when I was ordained a priest. God made a promise to be my God and to be with me and to take care of me. And on a day of despair, when you can't be in the cathedral, when you can't do the normal things that you are supposed to do, that you did in every other year, and you can't celebrate Mass, you can't do the things that you're used to doing, being with people, visiting people, anointing people, celebrating funerals and weddings and baptisms. You can't do any of that. You can't hear confessions. Don't you ever forget that I made a promise to you. I changed your name, and you will be okay. You will be okay. You will be okay because God has made a promise and God keeps his promises. All will be well. All will be well. I'm still a priest and I will always be a priest. I need to keep reminding myself of that. You are Father Adam and never forget it. As my grandmother said, this very same spiritual change that I am aware of in my life right now, more than ever, that this change of identity from a worldly identity to a spiritual identity happened in your life as well, when you were baptized, because in your baptism, you too are a priest. Each one of us, when we are baptized, we become priests, prophets, and kings. And your name was changed. That's the first thing we hear when we are baptized. What name do you take or what name do you give your child? Because the name signifies our identity being transformed from being of this world to becoming and belonging to the king of the next world. You no longer are of this world. You, as Jesus says, you are to be in this world, live in this world, but be of a different world a spiritual world, a world that we are being awakened to right now like in no other time, that we are only dust and this to dust shall return, but the soul lives forever. Don't forget it. God made a promise that you, God made a promise that you will prosper. You will be victorious. All will be well. You will be okay. Does God lie? Did God not make a promise to his son Jesus and keep it? Of course he did. God made a promise to Abraham and he kept that promise. God made a promise and God keeps his promises. Abraham's name reflects the amazing promise that God has made to him and to his wife, Sarah, that his descendants would be as numerous as the stars of the sky. Abraham can't imagine what God is up to. You can't imagine what God is up to right now as you're going through this coronavirus pandemic, as you're stuck at home, or you think you're stuck at home. You're safe at home. You're not stuck at home, but you feel like you're stuck at home as you're going through a time of economic uncertainty, as you see the stock market crash, as you can't put up anymore with your spouse 24-7 or with your kids, as you, 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 know, you almost feel like a, a, after you turn on the television and, and, or listen to the radio that you're catching this coronavirus just from the news. You've been saturated with fear and worry and anxiety. You can't go to church. You can't go outside. All of this... And you can't imagine what God is up to. But God gave you a promise. 
And that's what we do. We trust in the promise that God gave us. Jesus, I trust in you. Not in the world. I trust in you. As God made a promise to Abraham, he made one to you. And the name of the game of the life of a person of faith is trust. In ancient times, people believed that your name represented your identity and spoke of your destiny because your name represented your inner core, your deep, deepest self. So if your name got changed, your identity got changed, and your destiny as well. You understand this? The correlation between the name and our identity, and then that then reveals our destiny. Your identity is a child of God, which then tells you your destiny. You are destined for something more than just being now in this coronavirus hell. And it is. With all the people dying, so many countries, 145 countries now affected, thousands of people, it is hell. But that is not our destiny. Our destiny is a life and glorious life, an abundant life, the life of God, the life of the Spirit. Your destiny is not the coronavirus pandemic shutdown, enclosure. Your destiny is not shelter in place. Your destiny is not to be always inside, not being able to go out. This messy mess is not your destiny. Being jobless is not your destiny. Not being able to pay your bills is not your destiny. Living in a place of fear and worry and anxiety and depression is not your destiny. Living a life enamored by money, work, luxury, material stuff, addictions, the casino, alcohol, drugs, sex, pornography, going out all the time to restaurants and not staying at home and eating with your family and cooking for your family. Those are not your destinies. You have a different destiny. Not having time for God or prayer or mass. Those are not your destinies. Working overtime as if you were a slave 12, 14 hours a day. Those are not your destinies. You are destined for more. You are destined for greatness, spiritual greatness. And God is your destiny. Heaven is your destiny. The heaven now that God wants you to experience with his salvation, his health, his healing, and the heaven of the life to come when you get reborn in the spirit, when you are reborn to the life of God. That is your destiny, not the coronavirus. This is only a tool that we are going through. Only a tool. Something to wake us up. So use it to wake you up. To realize your true, your spiritual destiny. Wake up, says the Lord. I have changed your name. I have changed your name. I am your God and there is no other. You are mine. Look what I have promised you. And once you hand over your whole life to God, your plans change. Your destiny changes. What you treasure changes. You no longer treasure money, stuff, material possessions, but you start treasuring the people in your life, your spiritual life, your inner health. You live in the destiny that you are destined to. Heaven, that's where we are to live. And heaven is joy. Heaven is cheerfulness. Heaven is happiness. It's the presence of God. That's what God wants for you. But you have to be reborn to that life. Leave the other identity, the worldly identity, and take on the identity of God. Everything about you needs to change. Even your name. Abram is no longer Abram. Huh? He is now Abraham. In the Gospels, we see this all the time. That's why Simon is changed to Peter. Paul used to be Saul. 
now he's Paul. He takes on a new identity in Christ so that it's no longer Paul who lives, but Christ who lives in him. No longer Abram, but Abraham and God in him, God's spirit in him. You are no longer, in other words, part of the world identity. You are different. You are holy. In fact, the Bible in the uh, New Testament, the letters of Paul, addresses the followers of Jesus as saints. Saints are different. We are called to be saints and great saints. Don't miss your opportunity. And to be a saint, it's from the Greek word meaning different, different, to be separate, separate from all the world gives us, all the distractions, all those unholy, sinful ways, to be different. And in fact, that's when, when they, in the early church, when they look, looked at Christians, the others, they would say, look how different they are. Look how they love each other. Look how they forgive each other. Look how generous they are. They held everything in common. Nobody lacked for anything. Look how different they are. They were saints, which is what we are called to be. So you are no longer the worker. Huh? You are no longer the worker B as your identity by being addicted to work. Your work is no longer your identity. The, co the communists, when I lived in Poland, and the people were all always embedded with this, that your identity is a worker, a laborer. That's your work. Work makes you free, the Nazis said. And the communists instilled this very same thing. Work makes you free. The only one who makes us free is Jesus. Internal freedom not outside freedom. He frees our soul. He frees us so that we can live the life that he wants us to live. You are, when you, when you take on the identity of Jesus and you allow him to change you, you, you no longer have the identity that the world gives you. Like the fact that you are a casino addict huh? because you go to those Gamblers Anonymous meetings and if you do have an addiction to the casino, you need to be in the Gamblers Anonymous. This is your time. Take this opportunity. But that doesn't define you. Your addiction doesn't define you. Your sins do not define you. You are not the alcoholic, the drug addict, or the divorcee, uh? or the former prisoner, or the one who cheated on her husband or his wife or the one who betrayed, or the one who filed for bankruptcy, or the one who beat his wife in the past, or the one who failed at a business venture, or the one who didn't do a good job as a parent, or the one who had his house foreclosed upon. You are not the one who had an abortion, or who didn't, or who didn't do a good job in raising your children, the one who should have done this or that. You don't have the identity of the world. You are not the fat guy or the fat woman that the world tells you you are or the ugly one or the worthless one or the sick one or the one who was sexually abused. No, just as these biblical personalities, Abram was changed. Peter got his name of Peter. Paul is no longer Saul. You too need to experience that change, that identity change. You need to have that same identity changed when you have an encounter, a personal encounter with Jesus. And when you encounter God, you are changed. And you live in that change. You live in your newfound identity that was there all along. You just need to find it because you're baptized. You have the Spirit in you. You're a child of God. 
even atheists, people who don't believe in God, even they are children of God. They may not believe in God, but God believes in them. God believes in each and every one of us, and God wants us to have that identity change. You just need to discover it. Maybe that's why you needed a coronavirus wake-up call. huh? Think about it. A coronavirus interruption. Jesus says, excuse me, pardon this interruption. Huh? You know, you who were so secure in this life, hello, wake up to rediscover your new identity and that which is important in life. To live the faithful life of God in Jesus. So live your Jesus identity. I am. I've been reminded to never get down and to never forget who I am. Forget not, said my grandma. And forget not, says Jesus. But see, before we discover Jesus and come to him and give our life to him, we live in a world that applies to us the world mortal. That's the identity the world applies to you. When Jesus comes over you, which is the source of our peace, when Jesus comes over us, the world may apply to us one identity, like mortal. But in Jesus, encountering the risen one which we are about to encounter as we live out the holiest of weeks of our life, when we encounter the risen Jesus, this identity changes from mortal to immortal since Jesus offers us eternal life. Before we encounter Jesus and have this reawakening of the life of the Spirit, before we encounter Jesus, our identity is that which the world tells us, which is that you are a sinner. But once we encounter Jesus, we have the identity of forgiven. Ah, that's my beautiful identity to be holy, to be a saint, because I'm forgiven. Before encountering Jesus, one word applies to many of us, which we are now discovering more than ever during this coronavirus pandemic. What's that one word? Alone. Huh? But in Jesus, we discover that we are members, members of the one body, that we are not alone, that we are brothers and sisters in Christ and that we need to reach out to one another, all of us, because we are all one family, one human family with one father of all. Before we encounter Jesus, we are called dust, as we did at the beginning of this Lenten journey. From dust you came and unto dust you shall return. But that's not our identity once we have an encounter with Jesus, we know that we are destined not for dust, but for heaven. Abram, Abram reflected Abraham's past. Abram was his past, but once he met God, his name, Abraham, the father of many nations, the prosperous one, reflected his glorious future. You are of Jesus. You have a glorious future, a beautiful future that God has in store for you as he had in store for Abraham and all his descendants. And you are a descendant of Abraham. All of us. And once Abram met God, it didn't matter where he came from because he was Abraham, his past didn't define him. Don't let it define you. It didn't matter who his father was. God was changing Abraham and showing him 
the way to the blessed future God had in store for Abraham. And the same is true for you. God has a future for you, a glorious future. It doesn't matter who your father was in the past. That's your earthly father. That represents, you know, all the stuff of the world. What matters is your identity in Jesus. So whoever in the past gave you a name, whoever gave you a name in the past, whichever father gave you a name in the past, you know, maybe the father, you know, that was in charge of you at work or the one that was in charge of you supposedly in your marriage or the one that was in charge of you in some addictive behavior, whatever gave you a name in the past, it doesn't define you. Whoever called you a name when they were bullying you. I was bullied in school, so I know what that's like. I used to be very heavy. And people called me fat and all sorts of other things. But no, those are not my identities. Worldly identities are not our identities. They don't define me. And the coronavirus doesn't define me and doesn't define you. God defines me and God defines you. God defines you so to hell. To hell with all those names and definitions and identities that you have adopted in the past or that your ex gave you or your abuser gave you. Maybe your abusive parents or the person who abused you sexually gave you or the person who abused you physically gave you, or your haters gave you. To hell with those names and identities. They don't define me, and they don't define you. To hell with that identity of the prejudiced people, or the racist people, or the sexist people. To hell with the identity, with the name that your jealous and envious co-workers tried to give you to try to define you and make you believe that that's who you were and that got you down to hell with all of that by the power ooh, by the power of God cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who prowl about the world seeking the ruin of souls your soul by ruining your identity to hell with them because I and you are no longer defined by all those worldly terms. I'm no longer defined by the fact that people told me I was fat or ugly or no good. I'm no longer defined by that. All those people who were against me, who hated me, they don't define me. And none of them define you. I have a glorious future. I know it. I feel it. And you have a glorious future too. And that is tied to our new identity. The new identity which I am now rediscovering more than ever. The identity of child of God. In the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the line of Jesus, in the line of all the saints. And that my identity as child of God, whose descendants will be as numerous as the stars of the sky, that is what counts. And that what I am going through today and what happened to me in the past cannot control me unless I allow it to. And I will not allow it to. I will not. To hell with all those evil and negative thoughts and thoughts of my past. For I am hearing the voice of God who is calling me. Calling me by my new name. Oof. Blessing me and inviting me to live in the blessing, now and always. Amen.